Anybody! Call anybody! We need some help! Please help us! Call the state patrol! Call the police! This looks like a job for... We need help! We need some help here! Call, call the police! Call the mayor! That's who call the mayor! Call Tim Hill! Call the... Speed Walker! <laughs> physically fit superhero who fights crime while maintaining strict adherence to the regulations of the International Speedwalking Association. Heel toe, heel toe, Speedwalker! Welcome to Mount St. Helens Goes Boom with Bill Nye, the Volcano Guy. Brought to you by Cowlitz Indian Tribe, Mount St. Helens Institute, King 5, and AV Factory. Now, please put your virtual hands together for your host, Executive Director of the Mount St. Helens Institute, Ray Yerkowitz. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I love Speedwalker. That was great. Uh, we've got a great live stream for you tonight. Uh, I'll share a little bit about why we're all here together and then jump straight into a candid conversation with Bill. Halfway through, Jim Dever, uh, uh, the host of King Five's evening show, will, will hop on to get Bill's insights about COVID-19 and maybe even give us a story or two about Bill's early days in television, as you just saw there. First, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors for making this event possible the College Indian Tribes Arts and Education Fund, Seattle's King 5 TV, and AV Factory. And thanks to Austin's own Shiny Ribs for the COVID era appropriate music you heard earlier. And there are a couple tunes about uh, space in there too. Bill's a longstanding supporter of the Mount St. Helens Institute, and we're a nonprofit here in Southwest Washington that connects people from all over the country with science, the outdoors, and public lands through the lens of the Pacific Northwest's most active and youngest volcano. As you might imagine, uh, the virus has completely disrupted our regular programming this spring. But we've adapted by offering a variety of new uh, programs online to meet folks where you're at online. Programs like Volcano Tuesdays, Views and Brews, and tonight's uh, live stream are all examples of that. In fact, join us tomorrow on Facebook Live for an interactive take on the Portland Art Museum's Volcano Exhibit. It's the first ever comprehensive display of Mount St. Helens art. When we can safely and responsibly get back to normal, whatever that's going to look like, we want to ensure that thousands of school kids and the classes that we serve will again experience outdoor school at Mount St. Helens and get to know the volcano in person. Middle school girls will again spend a week in our GeoGirls program, working alongside female geoscientists in the field, engaging in hands-on geology and technology. And I can't wait until we, together, uh, will again feel the crisp morning air of a summit climb, or the magnificence of a hike into the crater with our guides and scientists. These awe-inspiring experiences are made possible by generous, generous supporters like you. Your gifts ensure that the Institute will continue connecting people with science, uh, critical thinking, the outdoors, public lands, all things that are so important right now, as we all know. And Bill totally gets this. He understands the power of the volcano to change the way people think about the Earth and about science. That's why he's been a supporter of, of Mount St. Helens and the Institute for over 20 years. And you probably know that Monday is the 40th anniversary of the 1980 eruption. It would mean the world to me, to Bill. Really, it's not about us though, it's about the thousands of kids and people of all ages and the backgrounds that we serve and whose lives are transformed when they get to go to the volcano. It's a magnificent place. So to honor the 40th anniversary, I invite you to make a donation of $40 or whatever amount feels right to you. It's super easy to donate. You'll find some links in this live stream. We really appreciate your support. 
So you all know Bill Nye the science guy, right? Well, tonight he is Bill Nye the volcano guy. Hey, Bill, why don't you join me here? Let's talk about Mount St. Helens for a bit. Ah, here we are. Greetings, Ray. Greetings, everyone. Mount St. Helens changed my life. Oh, it's cool. And how, how did that happen? I, I want to kind of start out, I'd like to hear about uh, how Mount St. Helens first came to you. Well, you know, I went to engineering school back east, but <clears throat> I always wanted to climb mountains, and I loved airplanes, and so I was able to get a job at Boeing worked on 747s and I just everybody don't worry I was very well supervised for everyone on 747s perfectly safe uh, so I with the Boeing Alpine Society Bow Alps I climbed a lot of peaks around uh, the Seattle area and some in the Oregon Portland area and uh, I was away on a business trip when the Mount St. Helens blew up on May 18th, 1980. But since then, I visited Mount St. Helens several times, and uh, it's a spectacular place. So we call it the Eruptiversary because it changed life in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, everywhere you go, you can see evidence of this dramatic explosion. It's really something. Yeah, I think you, you told me a story about being in Salem. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, it exploded uh, in May, but there were some further puffs as uh, that season went along, that summer and so on. And I think we have a picture of playing Ultimate in uh, Salem, Oregon. So uh, for those of you who for some reason don't play Ultimate Frisbee, which is just weird, uh, it is a fantastic sport. It's the only team sport in which the offense cannot score unassisted. It's a non-contact sport, and you run and run and run. So this picture was taken by my longtime friend and old roommate, Kai Bune. And it looks like, it might look to you like it's washed out, like uh, it's overexposed in the background, especially. Uh, that may be true, but the big problem is there was a low fog induced by the dust, the ash in the atmosphere. And if you look at the field, the turf, you can see this gray color, especially their camera left. And that's dust. That's ash from Mount St. Allen's. <laughs> and when we ran along, it was puff, 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 puff. You'd see like little puffs of ash, like you were running across a field of baking flour or something. It was really spectacular. And it calmed down enough. And we were going to play anyway, but I didn't feel any respiratory effects. But shortly after... The uh, main eruption, everybody, you know, airplanes had to be rerouted because ash was getting sucked into the engine intakes and so on. It's a really serious problem. And there were bumper stickers, don't, don't visit, don't come to Washington, we're on our way to you because pieces of Mount St. Helens went all the way across North America with the jet streams. Really an amazing thing. It's pretty mind boggling. Uh, so how did you, when did you come back to Mount St. Helens? Was it during the Science Guy show? Was that the next time yeah. you kind of spent so some time there? The second Science Guy show back in 1993, and for some of the listeners and viewers, there were people alive in 1993. You know, uh, they were around. And so uh, our second show was about the Earth's crust. And we went to Mount St. Helens because there's so much to be learned and demonstrated when you visit a recently erupted volcano. And so we were there with a scientist from the, from the Volcano Observatory in uh, Vancouver, Washington, uh, Dan Dzinski, and he showed us around. And just, you guys, it's the scale of it. If you haven't been to Mount St. Helens, it's just wild that it's so big. It's just huge. And so you look at it, you might see pictures of Mount St. Helens and what, look like, what looks like gravel is actually enormous <laughs> boulders. And when you get close to it, you don't have to be a geologist to see that the different boulders, the different rocks, are made of different rocky stuff. Because what happened, this uh, volcano has erupted so many times over the millennia that there are layers. I, I liken it to a giant having taken a bite out of a giant piece of Russell Stover candy where you wonder what's inside. Is it, is it fudge or coconut cream? 
And so uh, when you look at Mount St. Helens and see that you can see the layers in the crater, uh, it's, it's just spectacular. It shows you the power, the power of uh, volcanoes and how much energy is stored below the Earth's crust. Yeah, the scale of that place is something else. And, and to be able to see into the earth is a rare opportunity like that. So uh, it is a spectacular place. You ended up joining the board sometime around then, maybe through the Science Guy show. Is that correct? Yeah. So what happens, you guys, it may happen to you. You Let's go to Mount St. Helens. Then you meet the Mount St. Helens Institute Board of Directors. And let's look over here, Bill. Oh, look at this. Peter Fresen. Look at this. Oh, cool. Here's <laughs> this amazing plant. Oh, here's some insects. Oh, uh, and then you, then you go out to dinner and you come, you go to the men's room, you come back and you're on the board. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, cool. So uh, uh, no, it's great, you guys. It's a spectacular place, and our mission at the Mount St. Helens Institute is per, to promote the science to advance the science and appreciation of volcanic landscapes. Volcanoes tell us so much about the Earth and the cosmos and what I like to call our place within it. So are we looking at these slides or are we getting ready to look at these slides? I'm over here. Well, here we are on the on the rim. I, I see your picture on the rim there. Why don't we talk about the crater trip last summer? Because there was so many cool things to see. We've got some great pictures uh, from well, Tega, well, from Seattle Met. So. Okay, before we go to that, uh, did you yeah. have those pictures from the rim? Or are we saving those? I think Sorry, we everybody. We, 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 we pre rehearsed this with great precision. But the <laughs> reason uh, I'm lying down in that one picture on the snow is because it's a cornice. Uh, for those, and that's Mount Rainier in the distance. And if you look carefully, you can see a layer of smog that sloshes in from the Seattle area. And uh, it's the same sloshing that enables the Snoqualmie ski area to be snowworthy. This cold air sloshes uh, eastward. So uh, anyway, the reason I'm lying down is if you go another meter, another body length or two, the snow may collapse and whoa, you go down in English units, I don't know, 200 feet, 300 feet. And so everybody, if you're not familiar with climbing around snow which we have in the northwest keep in mind that the snow will form a layer uh, uh, uh what's the french word cornice over the uh, cliff and so it looks like solid snow and you can stomp on it it seems solid but when it breaks man down you would go and so uh, it's just you don't do that anyway and i've done that with uh don uh, uh john rather from the board of directors and uh, we roped up and kind of hung over big, stupid fun. But then the other one is of the whole board from several years ago when the snow is all gone and we're standing on the scree. Scree is a Scandinavian word for the very fine pebbles. And the thing about scree, you step on, you slide back, you step, there we are. And the, the, the rim is just a, a couple body lengths off camera left there. It's just spectacular, you guys. You're looking into this cirque, this circle of just open giant hole in the earth it's just man you're on top of a big cone you know it's just amazing so then uh then ray you wanted to go to the one after that right let's talk about the crater trip right so that's yeah, the other yeah. perspective you can look at the volcano from up on the rim and down and in or you can hike up and and see into the crater which we did uh we did last summer so there's some great photos thanks to, to tegra and seattle met who provided those for us so yeah let's check them out was, she was great yeah, so here's walking in, you guys, all in in English units. We did about 11 miles. We did uh, 11 and a half, you know, 18, 19 kilometers, and it was cool. I mean, it's just amazing. So you walk up to it, and you've everybody, you've heard the story. Things are just much farther away than they look when they're big. It's just amazing. And the other thing that is amazing, I remember very, very well driving down I-5, up I-5, playing Ultimate or visiting people in Portland. And... The Toodle River Valley there, everything was just gray, just dust, just gravel as far as you can see. And I used to say, it's so much, there was so much destruction from Mount St. Helens, you'd think humans were involved. It looked like they were building building some enormous uh, shopping mall, whoever they are, you know, they are very busy. Uh, they'd be, this thing just went as far as the eye could see, but then you look here in the crater, crater hike photo, you see that uh, 
grass and trees are coming back. And this has been one of the one of the spectacular things that has fa that have fascinated that has fascinated scientists who've studied the ecology of this area is how quickly plants have re plants and ecosystems have reestablished themselves. It's spectacular. It sure is. Let's go to the next picture too. We'll, we'll roll through all of these and you yeah, can kind cool. of get a feel for, for what the whole place looks like. There we, there go. we go. Yeah. So you guys, you're saying, well, that's a lot of gray rock. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's a volcano. Yeah, man. Well, man, it blew up and it's, uh, and it's just the scale of it, the size of the rocks and the, um, the distances involved are really something and you can see you don't have to know anything about geology you can tell that it's recent the rocks are jagged it's not they're not old water stream rocks that are smooth everything is is new and sure enough way up the hill there up the mountain your steam being released even now and there's a little bit of a glacier even in late in late summer in uh, september and there's a bomb, as they're called, and uh, just like a oatmeal cookie, the outside of the bomb cools off before the interior. And when it cools off, it shrinks. The interior is still pushing on it, so then it cracks. I mean, it's just amazing. And so skilled people like the geologists we were with on that hike can tell uh, pretty well the temperature of the rock when it cool started to cool and what it's made of so how deep it came from and uh uh how it ended up where it did down the down the slope very cool and uh let's, let's check out the next picture too roll that digital image okay I'm feeling the yeah there, there. so there's a station as it's called where, um, you know, global positioning systems are so sophisticated now that we can determine, I say we, geologists who have placed this thing can determine its movement within centimeters, you know, within fractions of an inch. It's solar powered. And so we, they, your tax dollars, monitor the motion of the mountain because uh, if it were to erupt again or if it were going to get ready to erupt again, We'd want everybody to know just from a public safety standpoint. But the other thing is we learn. We learn about the nature of the rocks, the nature of tectonic plates. And so, you know, Ray, when I was young, when I was in elementary school, the idea or the theory of tectonic plates was still a little bit controversial. People weren't completely sold on the idea, even though... Uh, uh, Wegner, the scientist, had been to both Africa and South America and found the same, the same layers, the same strata, stratum of rocks carrying the same types of fossils, uh, thousands of nautical miles apart. And just intuitively, you can see where Africa fit into South America. And yes, as you go up, when you're hanging with Ray and the board of directors and these young these young people who are excellent hikers, uh, it gets steep. Yeah, it does. It gets steep and, uh, and you can see the rocks change and there's a fabulous expression in geology, the angle of repose, where the rocks come, the angle that the rocks come to rest and it depends what kind of rocks they are and how deep they came from inside the volcano and how they ended up here, how high in the sky they were thrown when they came down, how fast they cooled and so on and so on. Uh, go ahead. There we go. And another one more picture. Is that it? We, we can go back to the tectonic plate, actually. We, well, uh, uh, yeah. Bill was, I was talking uh, about that. Let's pull up that slide. Oh, there we go. So that's Lewitt Creek, you guys. And and, and the word creek is it goes back at Mount St. Helens, but it's a you know it's a, a good sized. It's going on to be a river, and uh, it flows from the glacier way the heck up there. And the rock is uh, nominally called tephra. And it's porous, you know, water soaks through it and comes out some way. Because I don't know if you've been there, but it rains a lot in the Pacific Northwest. And so water comes down the mountain uh, in Lewitt Creek. And Lewitt's an old First Nations, First American word uh, that we still use today. 
That's right. Lawatla is actually the the full word. The Luit is just the kind of the anglicization of that. Lawatla. It's, it's the a good contractonym. Word. Yes. Yep. Here's and, a cool uh, picture of you. Uh, there we are. Yeah. So you can see where grasses and plants are starting to take hold, and uh, it's just spectacular. You would. I mean, you think. Come on, nothing can grow here, but now it's coming back. The soils are rich in the soil, the dust, the ash is rich in certain minerals that plants are quite fond of, but the thing that's generally missing is nitrogen. And you say, Bill, Nye, volcano guy, where would I get nitrogen? Well, from insects. So this is just, if I may, freaks me out. So, so many, the, the nature of the mountain, when you go into the crater, you're coming from the north side. The nature of the mountain, you know, on a nice day, the wind is coming from the northwest, right? Clockwise spinning high pressure system. And so the wind goes, as we say, upslope. Well, if you're an insect, you can't always fight the wind. And when you're an insect, you gotta go with the flow. And so there is what John Bishop on the board of directors calls an insect rain. <laughs> so insect bodies fall onto the mountain and they carry nitrogen and then the right type of plant takes advantage of that chemical and uses, metabolizes it and starts growing. And then when one plant starts growing, then some of the um, nitrogen fixing plants also get in there, the penstemons. And then uh, the ecosystem takes off. And then when a beaver shows up, people, and builds a dam, man, look out, man. Then it's ecosystem festival. It's a cool opportunity to see things kind of laid bare and simplified. And how do pieces come back together and how do they influence each other? So it kind of takes me on to my next question for you, Bill. Like, what, what are the, the, why are volcanoes important? What have we learned from them, right? We just talked about ecology and opportunity to see things simplified, but what are some of the other big picture things that we've learned from volcanoes? Well, we learn, in a sense, where earthquakes come from, everybody. We learn that the Earth's crust is not uh, a smooth sphere, like uh, an eggshell or something. It's broken into plates. And you probably heard the expression tectonic plates. It's from the Greek word for builder. The Earth's crust is built from tectonic plates. And when you're in the Northwest, the Pacific plate is subducting under the North American plate. And we have our own plate, the Juan de Fuca plate. Check us out. And so uh, these things, the Pacific plate gets soaked with seawater, like for reals. And when it subducts, and subduct is Latin for lead under, when, it's get, when it gets led under, uh, it's water soaked. And so then the heat of the earth, which is a result now of fission, of uh, nuclear reactions, deep, deep, deep within the earth, uh, uh, caused the water to turn to steam. And there's another fabulous volcano word, phreatic, P-H-R-E-atic, phreatic. And so uh, we learn from Mount St. Helens that the these subducting plates can have volcanoes explode and uh, i hope many of you have lived through an earthquake or two in portland seattle area and i hope everyone is ready for an earthquake i hope you have an earthquake kit at the ready and keep in mind not only does the earth move side to side the earth moves up and down and this is a result of the tectonic plates and the evidence of the plates is the volcanoes that are aligned on what we call the ring of fire, which is, <laughs> goes around the Pacific Ocean. There's the ring of fire. And so if you're in the Northwest, you got Mount Baker, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, Mount Jefferson, get down to Mount Whitney, Mount Shasta, Mount Heavens, Mount Shasta. And so these are all in the ring of fire. And so everybody, earthquakes happen. You can wring your hands, just get ready. And as we say, build, uh, earthquakes don't hurt people, buildings hurt, pe hurt people. So if there's an earthquake, get outside. So uh, this is easy to say, but not always so easy to do. But Mount St. Helens is where we learn so much about the earth. And if you're in Washington State, be very proud for 
a long time we've had we call uh, outdoor school and outdoor school has been a big part of the mission of the Mount St. or the the work of the Mount St. Helens Institute. You know, I I hearken to the movie that was such a big doggone deal, the Blair Witch Project. Now look, there are people stuck in the woods and they couldn't get out of the woods. Really? Get out of the woods. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> what is wrong with you? And so we want everybody in the Pacific Northwest to learn to be outdoors. It's fantastic. And we want everyone to learn about ecosystems and our place within them. We humans are big old animals and we are now in charge. We didn't set out to be in charge of the earth. We didn't set out to, to, to be put uh, in management of the earth, but we are. When I was a kid, I went to the World's Fair in New York, New York. The town's so nice, they named it twice. And uh, there were just now, just then, 3 billion people in the world. Well, now there's 7.6, almost 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. And we're all breathing and burning the atmosphere. And that's why we have climate change. And that's why we are now in charge. We have got to take responsibility for running the world's ecosystems. And so learning about the ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest, especially Mount St. Helens, helps you become a manager of the earth. And we need you. We need you to manage the earth. We do indeed. We need more people like to, to go out there and think critically, right? Vertical um, thinking is the key to our future, people. Sure do you is. want to talk about the U.S. Constitution? Sure you I, do. If, if you want, yeah, well, let's hear it. So everybody, keep in mind, we are, Mount St. Helens was a spectacular thing. It was also a dangerous thing. Uh, but now we're living through something fantastically more dangerous. This coronavirus epidemic, a pandemic is the, coin, the term that was coined. And uh, uh, the key is gonna be science. We are not gonna get through this pandemic we're not going to get through any earthquake without understanding the science of these phenomena. And so I remind everyone that in the U.S. Constitution, written 230 years ago, Congress shall promote the progress of science and useful arts. That's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution promote the progress of science and useful arts. And to me, useful arts, I mean, I'm an engineer, useful arts refer to engineering, where you use science to make things. In the 18th century, it would be architecture, bridge building, plow making, and so, uh, and all sorts of tools used in agriculture. So everybody embrace science. That's how we're going to get through this. As we like here, to here. say, back to you, Ray. <laughs> Well, Bill, I think you, uh, you had some hands-on stuff to show us. Well, just everybody. I love <laughs> yeah, Mount St. Everybody. Helens, like any normal person. And so you accumulate things made of Mount St. Helens ash. Here's a Mount St. Helens coffee cup, Mount St. Helens ash coffee cup. And skilled artisans know how to uh, gather the ash and fire it and uh, use it for a coffee cup. Unfortunately, this one, just a couple weeks ago, developed a crack over the heavens. But uh, there's no shortage of Mount St. Helens ash, everybody. Don't worry about running out. We got a lot of it. And then if for some reason anybody watching this uh, live stream does not own or use a Mount St. Helens salt and pepper shaker, I mean, first of all, that's just weird. Uh, but the other thing that's cool about a Mount St. Helens salt and pepper shaker is they're made of Mount St. Helens ash. This is Mount St. Helens ash skilled, uh, fired by a skilled artisan. But also this combination is quite accurate. It's an accurate representation of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. You know, you might see the Flintstones or some uh, diagram or chart of, an, of a volcanic eruption and your perception is it goes straight up the erupting material the ejecta that was ejected goes straight up and that's true to up to an extent but at mount st helens it went sideways and that's what made it so dangerous for the famous uh, geologist who lost his life there uh, 
uh, and we named the Johnson Observatory after him, where the where the the thing blew off sideways and it traveled at about the speed of a fighter plane. Oh, by the way, the Blue Angels are canceled this year. Freaking seafarers canceled this year. Anyway, the thing blew off sideways and then it sloshed down the Toodle River Valley. And you don't have to know anything about forestry to see where it went. It's still quite evident. The trees in the path of the hummock of the top of the mountain uh, are much younger than the trees around them. And so we showed that on the Science Guy show and on another show. And so everybody says, well, I've got to do a science fair project. I've got to do vinegar and baking soda. Okay, okay. All right. You can do vinegar and baking soda. And this is how you make a standard classroom volcano. And if you've never done it, just be sure you know how to do it. So here's what I do. We're all good Northwesterners. Everybody's got uh, baking materials around. This is uh, baking soda. I like to close it up with a piece of painter's tape, the blue tape. Everybody has espresso spoons. So what I've done, I took the baking soda and spooned uh, baking soda into a standard, uh, in English units, 11-inch balloon. So there's baking soda down in the bottom of this. I have a bottle of suitable smallness. That's vinegar. I used apple cider vinegar because you can see it. Any type, of, Generally, any type of vinegar will work. You put the balloon on top of the bottle like that. Then you shake the baking powder, baking soda, excuse me, I was joking, into the vinegar and the balloon inflates. Now, here's what I want you to get, everybody. If you ever do this demonstration, people of any age, if you're around it, it it's reacting, the, the base is reacting with the acid and liberating carbon dioxide. And that's what I want you to get. Carbon dioxide is the same gas that comes out of a real volcano. I mean, it's one thing to have stuff, and if you want to make it look cool, put some dishwashing liquid and uh, red food coloring to give it that orange color of molten lava. <laughs> but what I want you to get is it's carbon dioxide. And uh, this demonstration really works. I strongly recommend it for anyone who's never done it. And keep in mind, when you do that, you're doing a tabletop thing that's representing the spectacular effect that happened at Mount St. Helens. The chemical reactions are one thing, but it's steam from deep in the earth, steam that is liberated when the mountain blows its top. I lava it, Bill. I lava it. <laughs> he lavas it. See what he did there? Uh, See? That's an old one. Um, you know, I had some questions from uh, oh, good, some kids good. from our friends at the college uh, Indian tribe. Can I ask That's you a great. few questions? Is that okay? Please, please. All right, great. Uh, Liam Lounsbury, who's seven years old, asks, how far did the ash from Mount St. Helens go? It went all the way uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. Not all of it, but some of it. Made it all the way across North America because it blew high enough in the sky, uh, as high as airplanes fly, jet airplanes fly, 35,000 feet, 1,100 meters, 11,000 meters, and, f and then got blown by what we call the jet stream, which is this wind that blows at high altitude all the time, and it carried it all the way across North America. It's amazing. And if uh, we're talking about Mount St. Helens, but if you ever get a chance to go to Nebraska... You can visit a fossil site where animals were buried by a volcano that erupted what is now part of Yellowstone National Park. And Yellowstone Volcano and Mount St. Helens are part of the same system. They're part of the same ring of fire. That's cool. I, was, uh, I grew up in the Chicago area, and I was just talking to some people there this week, and they remember getting a dusting of ash on their cars in Chicago. It's like 2,500 miles away. So it you went know, a long distance. Cowlitz guy, if you want to walk to Chicago, it'll take you months. It went there <laughs> in a few days. Got another question from uh, Charlie Allmiller, age eight, and Madeline Doyle, age seven. Is Mount St. Helens going to erupt again, do you think? Yep, absolutely. That's a good Anything bet. Anything else you, you want to bet know? on that? <laughs> yep, but bet on nobody's that. Okay. certain when. And so think about this. 
the earth you guys this is really hard to to get your head around the earth is four and a half billion years old four and a half billion years it's almost a meaningless number if you want to count to a thousand it takes you about 20 minutes was well, 16 minutes and two thirds 16 minutes 40 seconds to count to a thousand if you just did one two three if you want to count to a million takes over 11 days <laughs> takes the better part of the of the uh, 12th day takes almost 12 days to count to a million to count to a billion takes 31 years and eight months if you could didn't sleep didn't eat didn't do anything for 31 years eight months you could count to a billion so when somebody tells you the earth is four and a half billion years old they're talking about an astonishing amount of time. And there's a famous, famous geologist, Charles Lyell, who said it was as though he was looking into the deep abyss, the dark abyss of time. And you've hear, you might hear the expression deep time, where it goes, the earth is so old that uh, things have happened for centuries, for thousands and millions of years. Anyway, Mount St. Helens, has erupted several times in the last few thousand years and it will erupt again and a thousand years compared to a billion years is almost nothing guarantee you it will erupt cannot tell you when good thing is though we, the scientists are actively monitoring it so even if oh we yes can't well we'll the be future, able when it, get, no when it gets close, close it. when it That's gets right. close we'll be able to tell you yeah so, uh, Quinn McCombs, who's seven, wants to know, what is the final step that makes a volcano erupt? I think that's an interesting question. Well, it's when the pressure, the force from the expanding steam uh, is, bit, is higher, more force than the weight of the rock holding it down. When the steam coming from the salt part was higher pressure than the pepper part, the pepper part blew off. But because of the strength of the rocks here and the cracks that had formed, it blew off mostly sideways. But still, it blew off, man, when the forces got out of balance. If you know, if you want to push something, you have to apply more force than the friction of the thing on the floor, right? That's and so right. the steam produced more force than... Um, than uh, the weight of the rocks. And that's a cool word. I love that word, phreatic. You're Northwesterners. Learn lahar, phreatic, pyroclastic, lava bomb, tephra, <laughs> magma. They're cool volcano words. There are lots of good volcano words. Hey, I I've got one last question for you here um, from an Anthony Zito. He's 16 years old. He was going to come to the shows we were going to have in Portland, oh, yeah. Seattle, but he can't. And he's a big fan of yours. Can you see this picture of him? Oh, wow. Check you out, man. <laughs> that you was look Halloween sharp. last year. There's um, nothing he, better. Now, so I wear a lab coat a lot, but tonight I'm wearing my Mount St. Helens vest, my fleece vest. I if love this it. vest could talk, people, this vest has been to the summit a couple times, and it's been to the crater. It's You've been all around it since Mount I St. Helens. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, he's yeah, I do. It has, I have that technology here. I've wondered machine. <laughs> so Anthony's from San Jose, and he wants to know, what do you see as the biggest technological breakthrough on the horizon as it relates to combating climate change and or our dependency on polluting resources? Here's what I'm excited about. When I was a kid, and then when I was in college, everybody was trying to produce fusion. Now, Nuclear reactors that are working right now work fine. France gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear reactors. We get several percent of our electricity from nuclear reactors. And that's fission. That's where big atoms fall apart. But what happens in the sun, any star, gravity crushes the material together, the atoms together, so strongly that they fuse they overcome the weak and strong atomic forces. It's called two of the four fundamental forces. And it releases a tremendous amount of heat, heat and light. And that uh, heat and light is what drives the sun. And so for most of my, for all of my life, people have been trying to produce fusion here on the Earth's surface and have been unsuccessful. 
what everybody's tried to do my whole life is shoot a beam of protons into uh, some very heavy atoms. Now, these are hydrogen atoms with an extra neutron and sometimes, yeah, an extra neutron. Try to drive it in so another neutron will fuse to it. It's not work. We haven't been able to produce enough energy to produce a magnetic field to contain the whole thing. But research is going on now where people, instead of trying to shoot protons into hydrogen, they're shooting protons into hydrogen boron gas. And so that hydrogen boron gas has six protons. And their belief is if you did it just right, containing this reaction in a magnetic field, you would end up with three helium nuclei, three uh, uh, nucleuses of atoms that have two protons. The six would reconfigure themselves into three pairs of uh, three pairs, three doubles, and release a tremendous amount of heat and light without radioactivity, without ionizing radiation. If this thing works, if this thing works, it would change the world. And that's what I'm excited about. Fusion on Earth right now, I'm imagining with hydrogen boron gas. What we want for everybody in the world is clean water, renewably produced, reliable electricity. That's what this uh, hot, it's not cold fusion, it's hot fusion would do. And access to the internet or whatever the internet, whatever you kids call the internet when the time comes. So we can have Zoom meetings and things like that. Live streams. Well, th this is great, and that's a good that's a good uh, transition. We're talking about big stuff here, and I would like to hand this over now to uh, the host of King Five's evening show, Jim Dever. Jim, you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Ray. I have enjoyed listening to this conversation so much. Uh, the first question to pop into my head, Bill, is how how do you stay so well groomed during the pandemic? Do you have uh, a hairstyle team coming in with gloves and masks and no, you guys, you just got to trust the numbers. Thank you. Yeah. But I have a razor, uh, an electric razor. It's a famous, uh -huh. I, I, I don't get, uh, I'm not, uh, what's it called? I'm not, uh, I don't have an endorsement deal. The famous one is the wall peanut, W-A-A-H-L. Okay. For those of you who shear sheep, you probably Where's use my a pen. I should be definitely writing this no, down. No, but every, but the peanut is a good tool. You just got to look in the mirror and trust it. Yeah. Okay. Wow, thank you. I had no idea I was that well-groomed. Oh, yeah. I've had all this and time. And recently, yeah. uh, well, well, let's leave it at that. Go on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. why don't we? Uh, in, in a minute or two, or 10 minutes or, or 12, I would like to I talk watched to you. My, my, uh, a woman watched a video, my sweetheart, and she, uh -huh. she trimmed my hair with the peanut. We watched okay. videos online. But that was a few weeks ago. Well, so it's holding up well, I think. And, and uh, this is important that we know this now. So thank you for sharing that information. And sure, a little bit I want sure. to ask you about your early days at King 5. I was a uh, cub reporter for Evening Magazine, and you were science guying and jaywalking. Uh, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry, not jaywalking. No, super uh, speed walking. Heavens. Speed walking, yeah, speed walking around the station and uh, lighting things on fire and um, – Look at you now. You've done good. So um, I want to talk to you all about the origins of the science guy. But first, I think there is a bit of an important discussion to be had about this dance that we're all experiencing right now between science and politics. I thought science was all about fact. I thought politics was about opinion. And uh, really, the two shouldn't meet. But there's a clash right now at a time when we really need people to trust fact and science. Well, and um, I well, just politics, wonder how you suppose we're going to resolve this. Well, let me say, science, I feel strongly, should influence politics. I mean, mm -hmm. science is the natural world. It's how we know nature. It's got to influence uh, political decisions. I feel but like it's going wanna, the other way, though, right? Well, right but, now, right? but you yeah. do want your elected officials to respect the facts. And so mm -hmm. uh, we are living at an extraordinary time where especially everybody, the fossil fuel industry has promoted the idea that scientific uncertainty, plus or minus 2%, what have you, is the same as plus or minus 100%, is the same as doubt about the whole thing. And that's wrong. And there, the influence of the fossil fuel industry has been extraordinary. 
and they have enabled uh, these uh, conservative cable news networks to influence an enormous number of people so that people, voters and taxpayers are not embracing science. And the internet, which everybody thought at first, if you read the early books about the early internet, everybody thought this is gonna be so great. It's gonna democratize, it's gonna democratize uh, information. Uh, everybody's gonna be able to share every, their opinions and it's gonna be great. But what's happened, it's enabled uh, anybody's voice to be recognized at the same strength as a respected authority. And so then uh, what happened, as you know, recently, the Russians uh, government uh, people, higher ease, were able to nudge the U.S. election. And not to go too far out on a limb here, but the United States, with its tradition of the electoral college, and the tradition that's taken hold of gerrymandering, we have elected the last 20 years, we've elected presidents that did not win the, the popular vote. And the, uh, we did it three times out of four. Yeah. And this has been not in anybody's best interest, but what's built in to the US Constitution is change. Change is built in. And when you hear people say, well, I'm an originalist of the U.S. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, we, we have amendments. What do you? So the Bill of Rights doesn't count because it's the, anyway, with the pendulum's going to swing back because you are not going to be able, we are not going to be able to deal with a coronavirus without respecting science. And everybody, yeah. I do a podcast. We're here hoping that you'll donate to the Mount St. Helens Institute, but I do a podcast called Science Rules Coronavirus Edition twice a week. And we have, exp we have experts on twice a week. You guys, we are headed to have it get much worse before it gets better. We are headed to real problems, a dark summer and a dark fall and a dark winter if we don't respect the facts of viruses. What is it we have to do, Bill, in your opinion, to, to get America reopened safely? What, well, what are the steps everybody are, talks are, about Are we doing them now? It doesn't seem to me we're uh, doing them right now. No, so, you know, everybody. And so in Washington State, we have Jay Inslee, which, who's, you know, a scientific thinker. He's a critical thinker. He respects the facts. He wrote a book, Apollo's Fire, about the need to to uh, use science to come up with new sources, renewable sources of energy and engage people around the world. So the pendulum is going to swing. What we need, and you've heard everybody talk about it, is testing, testing, testing. And so, well, if you get tested and you test negative, that's good, but you can get reinfected so quickly. So everybody, please, when you're out in public, I'm at my house in my office, I am not wearing a mask, but when you're out in public, please wear a mask. It makes a huge difference. If everybody's wearing a mask, it greatly, greatly reduces the chance of infection. And yes, yeah. we are all terrified of going to the grocery store, of handling anything, of handling a doorknob that someone else has looked at and so on. But the real thing that gets you sick is other sick people. And uh, the word sick is an exaggeration. The, one of the problems with this virus, we've had several experts on our show talking about this. One of the problems with this virus, there's several days when you don't have any symptoms, yet you're right. still, and this is the verb, you're still shedding the virus. You've got to respect this, everybody. There is no evidence. The same wind that took Mount St. Helens ash from Washington State to Illinois, that same wind can carry coronaviruses from Washington to Idaho. There's nothing stopping it. <laughs> it's going to yeah. take it from Montana to, to Minnesota and Wisconsin. There's and nothing stopping it. Will, yeah, and cars and planes will help that uh, happen a well, lot that's more That's what's quickly. extraordinary. Yeah, the planes, everybody. Now, if you got to fly, take precautions. Please wear a mask. Yeah. Clean your hands. Please. Try not and to touch your face. Even if you have no personal fear of the virus yourself, wear a mask because it just shows a good example. I mean, there's nothing wrong with showing other people a good example. 
Well, and besides, you're the, you're more likely to infect them. Uh, so, 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 hold it. But this is a big idea. I, we got to go. We got things to do. But Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens Institute celebrates the science of volcanoes and the beauty of volcanic landscapes. But when it comes to science and it comes to the Constitution of the U.S. and it comes to the First Amendment, you there are people extant who think who claim they think that they have rights. They have the right to walk around without a mask. No, no, because you can infect me. I have a right not to get infected. And there's this old thing. Can you yell fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire? No, you don't have a right to do just anything. You do not have the right to infect other people. And along this line, one of our old themes in science education is vaccinations. When the vaccine becomes available, get it. So we're going to go through a period of isolation. The four corners are testing, tracing, seeing who, with whom you've come in contact, uh, isolating yourself, or quarantine yourself, and isolating the populations that need to be quarantined, the four corners of this Thing. And then there are going to be therapies like Theraflu for this virus. There are going to be things you can take, antiviral drugs that will help you resist it, especially if you get them early. And then someday in the next couple of years, there's going to be a vaccine. I remember I went to elementary school, you guys, with a guy who had polio. You do not want polio. And then when I was in kindergarten, we got a polio vaccine. And uh, nobody gets polio anymore. So vaccines work. It's 200-year-old technology. But in the meantime, we've got to respect the science and mathematics, especially, of public health. And three okay, more well, things, Jim. Th three more wash things. Wash your hands. Okay. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. I just did. They are Good. so clean right now. I was Good. washing them while you were talking. I have, a, I have a sink just out of sight here on the one side and a, no, a mask factory over on this side. So I'm keeping it all. So, I'm keeping it so all cool. even a cloth mask does a lot, does a lot of good. They're, good. they're not perfect, you, but they do a lot. I'm glad to hear you reinforce that message because I'm kind of evangelical about masks. Myself. It's not magic. It's science. Science. Yes. <laughs> well, let's. Uh, here's the world's worst uh, segue in history. Okay, uh, it was about what a little over thirty years ago that you first infected the city of Seattle with your unique brand of comedy on uh, well, the Almost Live show, and you also taught people science in a fun way. And I, w I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the origins of the science guy, because I, I think a lot of people who grew to know and love you on your national show didn't realize that it had its origins right right there at King 5. Oh, man, absolutely. So if you take a tour of King 5, the doors to the main stage are still painted with the Almost Live logo. Uh, so everybody, there was a program. To, first of all, here's my claim. When Steve Martin had his initial success, his first couple albums, in my opinion, every major city in the U.S. and Canada suddenly had a, a comedy club, just like, mm -hmm. seemed like overnight. Right. And uh, there used to be a nightclub down near the airport, near SeaTac, called Montana's, and they had a Steve Martin lookalike contest, and I won. I won in Seattle. I did not advance beyond Seattle. <laughs> and yes, Steve Martin, a couple of years, three years ago, Steve Martin did finally get to meet me and he was very gracious about, that's a joke, everyone. He was yeah. very gracious about, uh, about the contest and how, where it led me and so on. So then uh, there was a comedy competition to me associated with the comedy clubs that were springing up. And uh Chuck Jones, who was the program director at King Five, and the program director, everybody at a TV station, is a big deal. He's kind of a big deal. He decided he wanted to have a comedy show. I'm going to have a comedy show. So we hired Ross Schaefer, who was the guy who won the comedy competition in 1984. 
And I crossed pa- and then he had a buddy, Jim Sharp, who lay, who went on to work for Comedy Central for many years. But I crossed paths with Ross at comedy clubs and John Keister at comedy clubs. Uh-huh. And so they said, hey, do you want to help write for the show? And I said, OK. And then I started submitting jokes. They weren't especially good. But uh, eventually I quit my day job, my engineering job, October 3rd, 1986, roughly. And uh, uh, that's when I was able to focus. And and one, oh, I was working full time for almost or as much full time as King Five would hire you, full part time. Uh, yeah. uh, and a guest didn't show up. Now, it's lost in antiquity. The stories vary. It was either Geraldo Rivera, uh, Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam, or this gal, Rita Jenrett, who was uh, married to a congressman. She became a Playboy model, and she had this extraordinary story. And one of those three didn't show up. And we had to finish six, fill six minutes. And Jim, you're a TV professional. Six minutes is a long time. Yeah, on, it sure on television. is. So Ross at a writer's meeting, just offhanded, well, you know, Bill, why don't you do that stuff you're always taught me? You're always talking about science. Why don't you do, you could be Bill Nye, the science guy or something. <laughs> well, it developed that. I was a young guy. I was United Way big brother in King County. And I would volunteer at the Pacific Science Center on weekends as a science explainer. I wore a different colored vest. And the thing I did all the time, what science explainers do, is pour liquid nitrogen around, which is hilarious. And so I did the household uses of liquid nitrogen. Because, you know, we've all got liquid nitrogen around. Oh, yeah. Of course we do. Minus 196 over, Celsius, minus 320 actually. Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's funny. You have the limp celery. It gets uh, crisp again. You, and you get the onion frozen in liquid nitrogen. You hit it with a with a knife and it shatters, making the same sound as gl- shattering glass. And the payoff is you roast marshmallows in something 320 degrees below zero Fahrenheit and chew it and steam comes out of your nose. Hilarious. <laughs> so after That's that, great. it became clear that the science guy should be a recurring character. And then one thing led to another. And I realized I was frustrated, you guys. I'm a mechanical engineer. I was working out in industry when the Ford Pinto was created, the Chevy Vega, these were horrible cars. The United States abandoned teaching the metric system. Everybody was in engineering was terrified of anything manufactured in Japan because they seemed to have better systems in place. And I was worried about the future. And I decided that getting kids excited about science was the thing I really wanted to do with my life. But it took me from 1984 to 1992 to even get things arranged enough to do a pilot. And so Jim McKenna and Aaron Gottlieb, good Seattleites, uh, uh, were working on Seattle today and they went off to start their own business and they hired me to do this video called Fabulous Wetlands for the Washington State Department of Ecology. And they are visionaries. I mean, and this is not their characters, may I just say. And they brought out the best in me. And and uh, we did these uh, series of shows. We did a pilot, and then we got a contract with public broadcasting and Disney and the de- and the Department of Energy provided funding, and we made the Science Guy show. And So, so the Science uh, Guy was, was your main jam uh, in Seattle, but you also did other characters. You did, uh, you do a great William Shatner impersonation, right? Oh, well, you know, I came of age as a comic where Star Trek was still, the original Star Trek was still in the public consciousness. You know, now we have Voyager, the Orville, uh, Deep Space, now we have, oh, the Enterprise, we got all these things. But the original Star Trek was still in the public consciousness, and it still had this mystery, why was it canceled? It was still a thing people wondered about. Yeah, and we loved it so much. So I did a Captain Kirk. I mean, but once you hear someone do Captain Kirk, it's it's pretty straightforward. But Bill Nye as William Shatner was a funny bit. You see, I just touched my nose. That's the kind of thing we got to stop doing. Doggone. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, you kind of have to, though, when you're being William Shatner. You kind of have to touch 
touch things on your face. Well, it's there's a lot of, the, of uh, William, William Shatner got involved with a lot of women or females, many of whom were not human. Uh, and that was, you know, it's his day at the office. And he barred <laughs> commands. I mean, he was, you know, he's leading a whole freaking starship bristling uh, one, with weapons. One more thing about, um, about your <laughs> earliest days as the science guy on Almost Live. You created a lot of fire in that studio. And I, I know our um, facilities manager, Florence, uh, oh, had brother. a lot of anxiety over that. How, did you, how were you able to keep doing that? Well, secondly, we were cautious. We had fire extinguishers around. But firstly, there is a guy that you knew very well, Bob DeShano, who retired. Mm -hmm. And he was the carpenter and the set builder. And so you guys, back in the day at King TV, there was a lot of people working all the time in cubicles. And Bob and his guys, Ralph and uh, um, Larry, could just make cubicles. Very nice, like better than Ikea cubicles. And Bob uh, was also the captain of the volleyball team, and he can serve with either hand. He can run a screw gun with either hand. He's quite a guy. <laughs> but Florence really liked him, and Bob was very nice to me, and Bob would insulate me from Florence. And so nice. we all got along, since you asked. We you all know, need a, a television life. station is a small organization based on trust and relationships. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, helping support science of all types. Uh, and today, especially uh, volcano science, I'm going to send it all back to Ray. You guys are going to wrap this so, thing up here. If you're watching the live stream, everybody, I believe you'll find a donate button. And yep. Ray, don't you have something to say about that? <laughs> well, Bill, actually, I was going to ask you, um, You've been involved with the volcano for a long time, really since 1980, right? When you were playing Ultimate Frisbee well, yeah, in the volcanic I, ash. I've been on the board for a long time, yeah. It, it feels yeah, like since an eternity, the 20th century. It? That's right. Yeah. So wh why do you keep con supporting the volcano? And how can other folks uh, step up to, to continue to make an impact? Well, the monument, as it's called, the Mount St. Helens Monument, teaches you about the outdoors and the earth and I hope you get these two things. First of all, the volcano, the mountain, the earth are much bigger than we are, than any individual is. And when you stand there, I hope you get this feeling of reverence, this awe for this amazing phreatic uh, steam-driven event and the centuries, the millennia of these events. But the other thing I hope you get is not only this feeling, this humbling feeling, I hope you feel empowered because we can understand all this by learning about the science of volcanic landscapes and the beauty of them. We can, we can appreciate them in these two ways, both scientifically, this uh, hypotheses, testing, see what happens and start over the scientific method, but also the beauty of it. And I hope it fills you with reverence and I hope part of that reverence is your brain is only this big. And I like to joke, of course, my old boss's brain was, well, that's, but with your brain, which is only this big, you can understand this. We can understand the volcano and the ring of fire and tectonic plates and steam driven uh, rock explosions and the rheology, the actual bending of rocks. Rocks, if they're big enough and thin enough, bend. And that's what goes on in, um, in subduction zones and, and uh, ridge building. It's what goes on with tectonic plates. And I hope when you visit the mountain, visit the monument, as it's called, you get this feeling, this awe of how small we are and this reverence that we can figure it out, that we can understand it. And that just fills me with joy every time I think about it. So everybody, if you're out there, consider supporting the Mount St. Helens Institute. We have a few employees, and because of the coronavirus, people are not able to come to work, and we can't let people uh, visit the mountain. It's a tough time. Thank you, Bill. You're right. Awe and reverence, and uh, it's fun to have it's those joyful. feelings. It's joyful. Uh, to, to do the science, to understand it, uh, it makes your brain feel good. So everybody, be like Bill and make a contribution now, if you would. As I mentioned earlier, $40 is a great place to start. It's the 40th anniversary on Monday. Um, or feel free to give an amount that's right for you. 
you can donate on Facebook. You can visit our website. Uh, you'll find some links around. Um, and we'll keep this stream up for a little while, a few minutes uh, after the show, so you, you'll have time to make a donation. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. It was a lot of fun. I did a lot of laughing. Um, and a big, big thanks to everyone uh, working behind the scenes, our producers, Augie and Sally, uh, the AV Factory crew, and thanks again to Jim and to Bill. Really appreciate you too. Um, and we appreciate all of your support. Because of you, we can look forward to a future after the virus where you can join us at the volcano while still providing great ways now to connect with Mount St. Helens online. So I'm Ray. Stay safe and stay healthy. And enjoy one last tune from my buddy, Shiny Ribs. Thank you all. Thank you for joining Mount St. Helens Goes Boom with Bill Nye the Volcano Guy. Brought to you by Cowlitz Indian Tribe, Mount St. Helens Institute, King 5, and AV Factory. To learn more about the Institute's mission and to help them continue to move mountains, visit mshinstitute.org. Now, please enjoy one last song about the quarantine from one of our favorite indie artists. This is Stay Home by Shiny Ribs.
personal friend for over 35 years, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Nye, the science guy. Doesn't that feel great, Bill? Yeah. They love to see it. Doesn't yeah, that feel it's, great? It's cool. You yeah. know, we all feel great today. The crew's been telling me today, everybody's telling me, this is the science guy to end all science guys. That could mean it's either really dangerous or really cool, but I know there's a lot of really neat apparatus in the studio that I can see. It's, so It's really cool. It looks really neat. So yeah. let's, why don't we get to it? Let's do that, John. What are we getting, what, what is it tonight? What's the theme? I'm so happy you asked. Vortexes, vortices, if I may say. Vortices. Over here, okay. please. To the this official is the size and weight, almost live vortex generator. Looks like to all you know. Uh, so it looks like an ordinary trash can to me, Bill. Oh, John. With, well, I guess it is in a way. Yeah. Uh, but this is actually a precision instrument that generates puffs of air and vortex rings, which I'll show you now. Just may I take a moment and make sure we're uh, we're cool here? Yes. There okay. we go. Now, John. Yeah. Your yeah. task shall be okay, to strike this, this plastic membrane stretched over the uh, surface of the vortex generator, read, trash right. can, mm -hmm. and that will create these puffs of air which will put out, if I may, these candles. It can't yeah. be done. Oh yes, John. Oh yes, don't That's be skeptical. That's too far away. I'm, oh, Bill, yes. I have to say I'm skeptical. This is going to be really impressive. Yeah, now look, now look how far away this guy is. He's, he's way over there. All right, so you're telling me if I hit this... Oh yeah, tell you what, uh, can you move the orange door a little out of the way there? In the oh, front, okay. uh, yeah, just uh, pry the it, just door. force okay. it. Yeah, there you okay, go. Okay, good. Okay. Glad you've... All right, John, a puff of air, if you would, a vortex right. coming my way. Okay, let's see. Okay. Uh, oh, harder, it John. made it down. Let me, let me try it one more time Please. here, Bill. Whoa. I'll tell you what, John, turn it just a little that just way. Just a little, yeah. All right, phasers locked on there, there here. You okay, we got it. Okay, Mr. Mr. Sulu. Here we go. Oh. Okay, John, It's John, one John. of those fake candles. It's one of the, yeah, no, just, uh, just a little over this way, I think, now. Okay, John. Okay. Yeah, well, this is uh, live television. Like I said, the we crew really was have really fun here. Like I said, the crew was Let's really excited. Let's tighten this up. This is really cool. <laughs> Boy, this works every time, John. I gotta believe this is this probably worked really good at one time. Boy, that is just bugging me. Well, John, ladies and gentlemen, there. Yeah! It did. He did it. 